Professor uh, Peterson, it's a, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here, and uh, I'm very happy that you accepted my interview. So, welcome to my to my interview to my show. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Um, well, um, we are there are many uh, things we can uh, talk uh, about. You have um, covered uh, in depth subjects like gender, the patriarchy. You know, and in your books, you have talked about. How important it is to take care of ourselves if 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 we could sum that that complexity <clears throat> how important this is the fact that people take care of themselves that they uh, have purpose and meaning in their lives uh so in this uh, in this occasion i want i want to delve deeper into the the question of identity and that this identitarian crisis at every single level at the individual level at the national level you can put different first names political identity cultural identity And so there's an identity crisis. First of all, how could you, from your perspective, define identity? How can we provide a workable definition so we can build on that? Well, that, that's a really good question because part of what's happened is because it's such a complex question and because it's not a question that people generally consider in depth unless there's become a problem with identity, a lot of very simplistic solutions to what constitutes an identity have, have been put forth. And it's not easy to specify what's wrong with them because they're partly correct. So for example, part of your identity is your sex and part of your identity is your personality. And I suppose to some degree, part of your identity is perhaps your ethnicity or your race, but you can't be reduced to those elements of your identity. And I've conceptualized identity as, well, mostly as something you act out and then secondarily represent. And so, for example, if I'm writing a manuscript, I might consider my identity in relationship to what I'm doing. So partly I'm moving my fingers on the keyboard. Partly I'm typing out words. Partly I'm making the words into phrases. I'm making the phrases into sentences and the sentences into paragraphs and the paragraphs into chapters and maybe the chapters into a book. And then that's nested inside my identity as an author. And then that's nested inside my identity, let's say, as a professor or a researcher. And then perhaps that's nested inside my identity as a father, as a member of a family, and, and then as a member of an extended family, and then as part of my local community, and then my national community, something like that. And, and then perhaps I'm, I'm a sovereign human being. And then outside of that, I would say there's a religious element because the question would be, well, what am I in my essence as a sovereign human being? And to me, I'm something like the, the conscious force that balances chaos and order. And so all of those elements simultaneously are operating when you consider identity. And, and those have to be properly structured in relationship to one another too, so that you know what's more important and, and what's less important and what's more comprehensive and what's less comprehensive. And so it's complicated, obviously, that that's a very complicated structure. And the relation of the elements within that structure, how they should be related exactly isn't clear. But, well, I offered you one possibility In, in, in the structuring that I just described. So, so that's, and, and that in a, in a fully intact society, the question of identity in some sense doesn't arise in a traditional society because people flow smoothly from into their role, you know, in, in, into their set role in the culture. But one of the consequences of the radical amount of freedom that has been inflicted upon us or that we've earned, depending on how you look at it, is that In some sense, all of those things are up for grabs and up for question. And that does allow you a much more differentiated horizon, but it comes at the cost of substantial existential confusion because in some sense, we have to reinvent ourselves with each generation and that's extraordinarily difficult. And so I'll just close with this. And so one of the things that I've suggested to my readers is that you should do what other people do unless you have an unbelievably good reason not to. Now, if you have a good reason not to, maybe, maybe you're exceptionally creative artistically and you have to break barriers and borders because of that. But otherwise, it's like, well, you probably need to be educated to the level of your intelligence. You probably need a career or a job. You probably need an intimate relationship. You likely need a family. You likely need friends. And, and there's, there's more necessities than that. And, Maybe you can question one of those things and, and not do it even. But when you question all of them or maybe fail to do any of them, you're lost. You're completely lost. And, 
the problem with being lost is that it doesn't decrease your suffering. So you're lost and you're suffering, but there's no reason for it. There's no meaning in it. And so that makes you bitter and resentful and angry. And well, none of that's good, obviously, not for you or anyone else. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so well, so based on, on, on these, uh, let's say, preliminary definition or workable definition, you would say that we, there's a, from an individual perspective, there's an identity within it. We would, we could structure it as, as layers of, of, of an onion. You know, as, as you were building upon the different uh, elements that make us who yes, we are it, as an individual. It's like an internal cosmology in some sense. And that would be your felt sense of that identity would be your representation of what you're acting out. Right. So you're acting it out. But at the same time, you're cognizant of it. You have an internal representation of it. And hopefully those match. They don't always. Right. Because sometimes you do things that surprise yourself. And and so but the, optimally they match and optimally they're structured. And they're also structured in a way that's uh, comprehensible to other people, right? Because that's the other thing about your identity. And, and this is a huge problem with conceptions that make your identity dependent on your own will. Now, y your identity is something you have to negotiate with other people because you're constantly cooperating and competing within rules, generally speaking, but sometimes not, but you're constantly cooperating and competing with other people. And so they have to understand your identity or they can't understand the game that you're playing. And then there's nothing but conflict then. And so mm -hmm. the claim that your identity is what you feel about yourself at any given point is, well, it's nonsense. It's nonsensical to the point of incoherence. And it's also infantile because technically speaking, the only people who insist that their identities are only what they insist upon are children under three years of age. They're egocentric, right? They, they can't integrate their identity with other people. And that's a massive failing. And so for anyone to claim that their identity is merely their felt sense, let's say, of their gender identity, it's, it's, it's absurd. And it's difficult to defend against because it's so absurd. You have to take it apart. It's like, well, what's wrong with that? Why doesn't that work? because there's some truth in it, but as a definition of human identity, it's unbelievably, um, it, it's sparse and undeveloped and, and futile in the final analysis. Mm -hmm. so, so we're talking here, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Well, there's pain in that, eh, for everyone. There's pain in that for the people who are putting that argument forth, trying to justify their, often their um, deviation from the cultural norm on one dimension of their identity. And I mean, virtually everyone struggles with that to some degree because none of us fit the social mold entirely. The social being demands its pound of flesh from everyone and some people more than others, clearly, but you're still, it's still an absolute necessity as a human being to negotiate your identity with other people. Mm -hmm. So we're talking here about, of course, within this development, we're talking about self-esteem, your self-image, your personality. Uh, no, it's a non-materialistic uh, perspective. That's how it should be taken from my view uh, within this world, you know, which has turned very utilitarian and materialistic. Uh, that transcendental dimension of your identity has been gradually eliminated or, or there, there's a pressure to get rid of that transcendental yeah. dimension which yeah. is constitutive of the human being well so, the problem with that too is that's a big problem so i i suggested that the outermost layer let's say of your personality is something like well i think in christianity it's conceptualized as something like the logos right so that's, mm -hmm. the, that's what gives us divinity and that is that capacity to exercise consciousness in bringing the world into being something like that and hopefully to bring it into being with truth and motivated by care for for being itself, for by love, and so that's a transcendental concept of the sort that you were describing, and it's 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 a very very sophisticated idea. If that's criticized casually and demolished, then what happens is the necessity of that is transferred to some other domain, and so some other subordinate element of identity starts to play the transcendent role, and that's catastrophic. That's catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have, um, well, just to put you, and, and perhaps I would take you to a, 
it's a, a, a hypothesis that I'm developing, uh, this identitarian crisis. <clears throat> we live in a world which is ruled increasingly by this belief in science, where science has become, instead of an instrument, it has become an, an, an object of adoration. And it is gradually replacing God. So uh, within this uh, discussion of tr transcendentalism, uh, they are all saying us from the progressive uh, camp, you should believe in science because science will have all the answers for your questions. Now, the problem with that statement is that it's it's factually untrue. It's 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 false. That, but then again, it comes to this idea of the will that you were talking. You know, based on science and technologies, particular in technology, we can uh, change ourselves. Technology can facilitate this shift, this building, this chiseling of ourselves. And I come. I don't know if you're aware of this uh, of this ideology of transhumanism. Yeah. Okay. So my 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 hypothesis is that we are moving in a world of of technological freedom, of morphological freedom, gradually. And these categories, for example, transgender, trans age, trans capable, trans species, all these trans are like a step, a previous step towards full blown transhumanism. Now this might seem a little bit uh, off the of the of the map, but if you see the signs where we are encouraged to use these technologies, where scientific research is going on, where they are already experimenting with human embryos, or for example, when they are uh, fabricating uh, people uh, or babies in, in, in surrogate uh, you know, mothers. So in, human beings are becoming, are being objectified, to put it in, in, in some perspective. They are, they are being objectified. And once they are become a, a thing, with that thing, actually what you can do is you can manipulate it and build whatever you want from there. It's it's part of this identitarian crisis where... Yeah, well, that's a kind of materialist utopianism, I would say. There's some of that there. So, And you see that in thinkers like Marx with their insistence that human beings are basically social constructions, you know, that we're only social constructions and that we could be anything that we choose to be. And there is some truth in that because we are quite malleable, but... Well, but the, the problem arises is, well, when do you throw the baby out with the bathwater? You know, like I did a, a thought experiment about my son when he was a little kid. So, you know, you have a little three-year-old, four-year-old kid, and you're really fond of them and, you know, and want to protect them and all that. And and it's painful that they're so vulnerable, you know, because they can get hurt and they do get hurt. And, and of course, that's painful. And then you think, well, let's remove the vulnerability. So, you know, he's no longer three feet high. He's like, 20 feet high and he's no longer made of flesh and bone he's made of metal and his parts can be replaced and well with each vulnerability that you remove you remove some essential element of the humanity that attracts you to him to begin with and so the problem with a materialist transhumanism is that you know we risk in, we risk eradicating what it is to be essentially human now having said that i would also say that you know, human beings do try to transcend themselves constantly in their attempts to move towards an ideal. And some of the materialist endeavor is exactly that. I mean, we've used technology to enhance ourselves in a multitude of ways, and it isn't clear what the limits of that should, could or should be. You know, for example, you might consider, well, perhaps you could live 500 years. Then you might ask yourself, do you want to? Is that is that actually... A good thing is that actually a good thing and it's easy to say yes and maybe even to say well perhaps i could be immortal but but you know serious reflection reveals quite rapidly that that's an extremely complicated problem and so and we, but we are faced with this issue that you described which is because we're so technologically proficient this is part of that range of options opening up in front of us and and so well it's something we have to continually contend with and probably more so as time goes by Mm -hmm. Perhaps it is the case that part of what's pushing the trans movement is, you know, the attempt to blow the barriers of material reality. Now, I would say that's better done other ways. And there are other forms of transcendence that are perhaps more deeply satisfying. And I think they can be discovered. So, mm -hmm. yes, but I don't what... want to completely substitute material transformation for what might be more accurately and usefully conceptualized as a spiritual endeavor. Yes. Well, my default position is is against the use of <clears throat> technology to to enhance ourselves because the word enhance also 
it's also an, an act of faith. You are not necessarily enhancing what it's more precise to talk about modification. You are modifying the, <laughs> the human being. That that modification can go wrong or it can go good. But when you see transhuman transhumanists uh, thinking on all these endless possibilities that technologies like artificial intelligence, CRISPR, you know, nanotech, and all the robotics, prosthetics, all these options that are open there for for to to construct yourself as as in in ways that meet your ideal of perfection, your individual ideal of perfection, where we can have as many ideals of perf perfection as the number of people who live in this world. Then what I see is is as, as as I said, an act of faith because you never know what's going what's going to happen with these technologies. For instance, neuroscience, or you know, it's 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 in pam it's in pamper still. We don't know how the, the the brain works properly, but we are already thinking of modifying our brains to morally enhance ourselves. For example, so where do you see this? Uh, do you think it's uh, irresponsible to think in those terms? Because what you see also is that the media. Increasingly, the governments are mm. pushing this agenda of, you know, liberation through technology. But I, I guess it's the opposite. We become more enslaved in the name of, of, of technological freedom. I don't know what, what's your take on well, that. Well, look, I would. Look, there's a reason that I concentrate in my writings and my lectures on individual ethical development. And so I suppose there's a couple of basic premises that I've put forward. I, I, I wouldn't say that they're original, but perhaps the stress I've laid on them now is original. So I believe that people need meaning to bear them through suffering without it corrupting them. So that's the first thing. You, you have to have a meaning. And the meaning has to be sufficient to justify the suffering. And so that's an intense meaning because the suffering is not trivial. It's mortal. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. ultimate in some sense. And so, and then upon reflection, it occurred to me that people generally find meaning through the adoption of responsibility. They don't find it through the pursuit of evanescent pleasure. It's fleeting. And that's partly because, because you're an individual that exists across time and you know that, you're a collective in yourself. And so to be properly selfish means that you have to take yourself into account across the span of time from youth to old age, which means you're a collective, which mm -hmm. means that you have the same responsibility to yourself that you have to everyone else. And so in bearing that responsibility, you find meaning. And so then, and then you might need an approach to the responsibility. And some of this is allied with faith. One, would be perhaps you might decide that it's better to try to make things better rather than worse, that, that, that you're going to try to serve benef in a beneficent manner. You're going to serve being to the best of your ability. And that's a decision because, you know, the people, for example, the antinatalists have posited that there's so much suffering involved with conscious existence that it would be better if it didn't exist at all. <laughs> and that's actually not a trivial argument. Now, I think it's a terribly dangerous argument mm -hmm. and it can go very wrong, but I understand the argument. Um, but I think you decide that is that being human existence has the full range of emotional experience from absolute catastrophic pain and suffering to transcendent bliss. And well, you decide which you decide what you're going to serve. And, and, and that's a decision and it's an act of faith. And then I would also say that you organize yourself by being truthful, especially in your speech. And then, mm -hmm. and then you're the sort of person who can make the decisions that you're describing. So, and it's, it's imperative, you see, because you're part of your concern is that we become not only increasingly technologically powerful, but that the rate at which we're becoming increasingly technologically powerful is accelerating. And anyone who's tried to keep up with their computer can understand that, you know, so things change so fast around us that we can barely keep up. Mm -hmm. Okay, who can <laughs> handle that? Well, better people. Well, better in what way? Well, people perhaps who haven't cluttered up their souls with mistruths and, and errors. And I think as technology increases in its power, the responsibility that accrues to each individual expands. And so the necessity for careful ethical progress on the part of each individual becomes enhanced and then you say well how do we decide about technology well hopefully we have thoughtful people 
who produce a variety of answers to that question, and then the rest of us can discuss that and choose between them. And mm -hmm. hopefully those are people who are telling the truth, who are working to make things better, who are trying to adopt responsibility and to negotiate yeah. in good faith, all of that. And so you know, yeah. Jung, Carl Jung posited that when, El when science separated from alchemy, there's a tremendous expansion, like a Precambrian explosion in technology, but there was no concordant transformation of the ethical realm. So maybe it's the distinction between what is and what should be, right? The classic distinction between fact and value, even to some mm -hmm. degree, that we're nowhere near as sophisticated in our ethical thinking as we are in our technological thinking. Yeah, well, we, we have to pull one up to match the other. And, 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 and there's a hunger for that, which I think to some degree accounts for why what I've been saying has resonated with people, especially young people, is they know there's something in that. They understand that that's, that mm -hmm. it's a call and, and they can see that, you know, a lot of the popular movements now are in some sense calls to responsibility for young people, right? Take care of the planet. We're destroying it. You know, there, there are these calls to a grand adventure and that, that can't be dismissed out of hand because that desire to partake in that grand adventure is part and parcel of a healthy, well-developed late adolescence, let's say. It has to be nurtured by something. Well, I tried to return to our religious ethical traditions and see, well, what, what is the grand adventure, right? What is the adventure that's called forth by God, like, like Abraham was called forth by God? And I think it, it is more at the level of the individual soul than at the level of, let's say, group activities. And mm -hmm. I think the West got that right. It's emphasis on individual sovereignty and responsibility. Mm -hmm. I think that's the right way forward. I yeah, just uh, some comments uh, complementing what you said, and then moving to the to the part of the discussion is that my concern is that in the name of uh, technological freedom, we will actually become more enslaved because as as science rises, as belief in science rises, belief in God uh, goes uh, goes down. Uh, this thinking, this thought that we might become freer with technology is absolutely dumb in my perspective. Just from a practical point of view, let's say you think as a transhumanist and you say, okay, I'm going to enhance my arms, so I'm going to chop them and I'm going to put bionic arms or I want to see at night, so I'll pull out my eyes and I'll put in cameras connected to my neurocortex or whatever. What yeah. actually you're becoming, if we could become in a practical view, it, it will become you would become dependent on your providers, on your suppliers. <laughs> this would be a very terrestrial, very earthly problem. Oh, you have not paid your your fees this <laughs> this month, so we're going to disconnect you. So, for example, Neuralink, you oh, you have Elon Musk, you know, playing with these uh, microchips in your core, in your brain, in your brain. But then again, what about neurohackers or biohackers? It, it's just, you know, it, it, this well, idea that it's the standard problem, isn't it? It's the unintended law of unintended consequences. Which exactly. Otherwise, conservatives is like this. Well, ex yes. This excess, sorry, this excess of technological optimism blinds people. That's my concern. Well, it, it's easy. It's easy to to um, advance and 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 discuss the positive consequences and and fail to take into account the unintended exactly. consequences. But that's again why I think that because that's a perennial problem, and it's the perennial con problem of like what would you call thoughtful conservatives? Because thoughtful conservatives always say, "Well, what's the." That's the utopian end of the vision, but how could that go wrong? And then they note, <laughs> and, and I think accurately in some sense, there's way more ways that could go wrong than exactly. it could go right, right? So that's a combinatorial yes. explosion problem. So conservatives say, well, you know, careful. Yes. And well, my take on that again is because that problem's so complex, in some sense, it has to be solved by a distributed marketplace, by distributed computation. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. each of the individuals in the world is a node in that distributed computational network. And the more diverse and skilled those processors, let's say, the more likely we are going to be able to deal with the array of complex problems that our progress is going to produce. And so mm -hmm. then it goes back to the individual again. And yes. And, and well, that's, that's, <laughs> I can't see a solution that's more appropriate than that. That yes. wise people will make the wise, truthful people will be make the best possible decisions. Yes. You so. mentioned, you mentioned conservatives and it brings to my mind see Roger Scruton, who, who I had the, the pleasure and the honor to meet 
he talked about uh, respon uh, responsible pessimists. And I, and I love that, how he phrased that, you know, thinking always on, on how things can go wrong, but actually you need a counterbalance to this technological optimism, which, which from my perspective is a little bit dangerous. Another point here is that when we talk, and I will end this, uh, the idea of transhumanism here, because I want to move again into the subject of, of identity. Uh, transhumanism thinks of human beings as, as in a modular form. We are parts. We are not a, 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 a complete, a single entity. We can be replaced by parts. The second problem that uh, comes to my mind with this ideology is that in the name of diversity, what they be, what they end doing is they standardize identity because what they will do is they will make you just like clay, you know, human or clay where you can actually build whatever you want. It comes to the idea of, of what you were saying of the pronouns of self-perception, genders. How do I perceive myself? Well, you can perceive yourself in many ways, but at the end, what you will become is just a plasticine or a mass where you can just be shaped at will or become whatever. Yeah, well, even, even by your own preconceptions, I mean, that's exactly the of what Jung described as the persona. So imagine you're complex beyond your comprehension, but you have a, a view of yourself. Now, imagine you impose that view of yourself on yourself. Well, that is what people do when, when they're nothing but their persona. And mm -hmm. that's definitely limiting because we aren't only what we can comprehend about ourselves. And there has to be. And so what that would also mean, given your point, for example, is that we would we could be in danger of molding ourselves into far less than we actually are. Absolutely. So. That's that's a that's a critical point, exactly. And then again, if you become, let's say, perfect in in whose view of perfection you are perfect it it lies within what you have just I just said then again it comes to the idea of 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 this youth that feels very very attracted to these technological uh, developments you know technology is part of of the youth today in every single aspect it dominates their lives and but then in this current culture uh, where you were talking about for example the importance of duty you know, duty is not is not put into the table now. You are a subject of rights, and they are fed up with this idea that you are f you are a subject of endless rights, born from negative and positive liberties. If we talk it in, if from a Berlin, you know, Isaiah Berlin's perspective, the point is that people do not understand, and I think that's one of the biggest uh, problems in in modern culture or in postmodern culture is that the youth has not learned to appreciate the gains that come from suffering from commitment from giving themselves to others you know companionship i i don't know if i'm exaggerating but i see that i don't think they're taught very well that's my impression is that and it is part of what you described we've had an endless conversation about rights for 60 years let's say and that's left a hole because your rights are my responsibility and so there's no discussing one without the other and what happens is rights is like, give to me, give to me, give to me. And the problem with that is that it is better to give than to receive. It truly is. I mean, if, if you ask wise people what gives them the most satisfaction in their life and they think about it, they will tell you that being of genuine service to others is the highest form of pleasure. And, you know, that flies in the face of claims that our social institutions are fundamentally structured by the dictates of arbitrary power but that's only true for people who are that's an aberration not not the central tendency and so that's also partly why i think that look when i went around the world talking to people i talked in about 150 cities and mm -hmm. one topic always brought the audience to a dead halt as soon as i started to talk about the relationship between responsibility and meaning the whole place went silent and that happened <laughs> continually and i thought oh well, that means there's a hole here in our cultural discussion and that's not being addressed. It's like, well, you have all these rights, how people should, should allow you to progress according to your will, let's say. Well, are you going to find meaning in that? Well, you might if you're truly oppressed and, and restricted, right? But mm -hmm. well, let's say you're not. Well, and that you have as many rights as anybody's ever had in human history, essentially. Well, then what's missing? Well, what's missing is that responsibility. and. And once once that was articulated, when pe when I articulated that for people, particularly young people, particularly young men, I would say, mm -hmm. although not 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 solely, they're starving for that, and it's not being 
articulated for them properly. There's no justification of the patriarchy, let's say, you know, and, and your place in it. And, and that's a huge mistake. And, and the universities are unbelievably complicit in that regard. And maybe that's because, you know, intellectuals tend to be cultural critics because they're a little bit beyond where we are, generally speaking. They're mm -hmm. more open and and more verbally astute and, and all of that. And so they tend to be critical. But you can't just be critical, right? It's like you just throw everything away then. And when I go through a text, I don't throw it away unless it's worthy of being thrown away. I'm trying to garner the wheat from the chaff. I'm trying to collect what's good. And when we look at our culture, well, we can criticize it. That's fine. But we have to, we have to conserve what's, what's valuable. And if you say, well, it's all power, well, for me, to me, that's a confession about you, not a state about the, uh, not a description of the state of, of human society at large. It's so mm -hmm. cynical. And so we're not doing a good job of, of in, enticing, let's say, attracting young people in an articulate way into full participation in the culture. And it's terrible for them because, well, you do find your meaning in your marriage and in your, and in your children and in your career and in, and in your service to others. And that has to be made explicit and articulate. And, and we're not doing a good job of that. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now um, talking about responsibility and, you know, responsibility to others is also an act of love because it, it means some, you know, sacrificing your time, your, perhaps your interest for the sake of, of others' well, well-being. Um, this is better expressed by anything that by religion, especially by in, in, Christ, in Christianity, you know, this, all the traits that you are, that you discuss, and this is a personal interpretation. For example, in, in 12 Rules uh, for Life, which by the way, I, I have here, I hope that someday you, you will be able to sign it for me if I go somewhere to Canada or whatever. And, and now Beyond Order, which is your new book, uh, when you see each of those chapters, which you have touched upon uh, in this conversation briefly, but for example, uh, you talk about, you can synthesize each chapter, each chapter as, for example, kindness, uh, you know, responsibility, humility. And so, for example, you, you can, you can Probably. deconstruct, exactly. Now, where, where, within these qualities, um, what's the place of God in, in, in this, in this, uh, in this melange, in this, um, let's say, I don't, I don't know if you, if I could say this correctly, but in from within this secular perspective that you have provided in your books, where where, where does God come in? Well, you know, my my basic tendency is to not talk about anything metaphysical unless it's absolutely necessary, and and I think that that's an approach that's appreciated by people who've watched my biblical lectures, for example. Mm -hmm. So. And that, that's a rule of thumb in some sense. It's like Occam's razor is explain things at the simplest possible level and, and don't multiply complexity beyond necessity. And, but the idea of God, um, well, you know, we've, we've sort of accepted the idea that uh, people have asked me many times if I believe in God. Mm -hmm. I don't like the question. And the reason I don't like it is because it's ill-formulated. And so when you ask someone a deep question, every word you use becomes questionable because in order to answer the deep question, you have to assume that the question is posed properly. And it, it, very, it very seldom is. Everything's up for grabs when you ask the deepest of questions. And so I might say, well, what do you mean by believe? Mm -hmm, exactly. And you'll say, well, you know what I mean. I said, no, I don't know what you mean. And you don't know what I mean. And not when you ask a question like that. And then what do you mean by God? Well, and then people say, well, you're weaseling out of it. And, and I'm not. I say, I act as if God exists. Okay, so now I'm going to step back a bit and decompose that. Well, the first thing is that we generally assume that belief in God is something like acceptance of an axiomatic articulated statement about a fact, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, does God exist? Is he an object that is somewhere, like a table is or something like that, or like an old man is? And... and when you believe, do you say that you accept that fact? Well, I don't accept that that's what religious belief is about, not fundamentally. I think it's about how you act. Now, when I think about God, and I, I do that quite a lot to try to understand what the idea means, for example, mm -hmm, well, I mm -hmm. think, um, well, it's, 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 the, it's the spirit that possesses a crowd in the midst of a, 
uh, beautiful revelation of music in the midst of a rock concert when everyone's united. That's God. It's it's the force that brings the audience to their feet at a soccer game when a star athlete hits the target because that represents the opposite of sin and everyone worships that and they don't even know it. Mm -hmm. It's the it's the collective spirit that animates the philosophical conversation that's proceeded along the ages throughout history. It's the benevolent spirit of your ancestors. It's the call of your conscience to evaluate your shortcomings. It's the ideal that judges you. It's what you love about your father. That's all God. Now you say, well, does God exist? It's like, well, that's not the right question in response to those answers. Now, Jung, Carl Jung, wrestled with this very deeply. You know, he said, well, we have an image of God in our collective unconscious, and that would be manifested in those phenomena that I just described. Mm -hmm. He said, we don't know if that image corresponds to reality, but that's partly because we don't understand reality. So, you know, there, a lot of religious experience appears to be subjective. And... But it's common across people, so it's a weird kind of subjective. It's 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 subjective, but impersonal, transpersonal. If you, if you brief me very briefly, do would you incorporate a belief in God as as a, as an element of of our human identity? Is it part of our identity? Are we do we tend to be religious? There, it's, there, it's there whether you know it or not, in some sense, because whatever motivates you at the highest level of your identity is your God. And you can try to escape from that, but it doesn't really matter because you're, you're, you're either disintegrated or there's a unitary tendency that unites your values. Okay, that's another definition of God. It's the unitary tendency that unites your values. Mm -hmm. And maybe not just yours, yours and everyone else's at the same time. And that's a non-trivial problem. Now, it gets really complicated because you could also say, imagine that that unitary idea that, that speaks within us to some degree, especially in the form of revelation or creative intuition, and it's the muse that speaks within us when we're, when we're as honest as we can possibly be in expressing ourselves. And that's, it's a spirit that's, that's distributed across humanity, but also is localized within. And you could say that it's merely the mimicry of the central animating tendency of the human race. But then you might say, well, what's the central animating tendency of mm -hmm. consciousness or the central mm -hmm. animating tendency of self-consciousness? And then you're stuck with, well, what's the metaphysical significance of consciousness itself or self-consciousness? And I think that I can't distinguish the problem of being from the problem of consciousness. And so even if I try to reduce God in some sense to these phenomena that I described, it, there's no reduction there. It just, it deepens the mystery in some sense, but it, it's also, I think, helpful to people because they think, well, yeah, what is it we're doing at a rock concert? I mean, rock and roll, for example, emerged out of gospel music, at least in part. And it, if those aren't religious festivals, well, what are they? They're implicit religious festivals. And the same thing is happening at a soccer game. I mean, look how people react. And they do it completely unconsciously. Like when, when the goal is scored, everyone leaps to their feet. They don't, they don't sit and think, well, so what if a Peruvian kicked a, you know, inflated pig bladder through two posts? Why is that relevant? You, you look at someone who says that, you think, get in the game, buddy. Like wrong criticism. And so much of the criticism that's directed at religious thinking is of that sort. It's just not in the game. And, and, as I said, it presumes that belief in God is something like belief in something like a scientific fact. And that's exactly. just not the case. Mm -hmm. And so just, uh, we can also ahead, look at Christianity. Well, let's well just think about this one more way. So I've looked a lot at representations of figures of Christ, Im like images. Mm -hmm. And you know, the ones that have struck me the hardest are images of the Pantocrator, Christ is the word, usually in Orthodox cathedrals arrayed across the dome of a spectacular cathedral. I think, well, what is that exactly? It's this golden man with the sun behind him. That's the halo. So he's associated with the sun and with consciousness itself, arrayed across the sky. Well, does this mean an 
a man in heaven, like an old man in, in heaven? No, it, it doesn't. It means that the central tendency of human consciousness as it manifests itself across the ages has the cosmological significance of calling existence into being. That's what it means. And you can't just brush that away. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can write a book like Daniel Dennett saying consciousness explained. It's like, no, <laughs> not explained. And, well, and, no, go ahead, please. Sorry, sorry. No, that's all. That's all. I mean, uh, we have to take these things seriously. Look, and it's partly I've been speaking with some of the new atheists from time to time. And, you know, they've been set back on their heels to some degree by the reemergence of religious phenomena in political guise, because their presumption was, well, we abandon these appalling superstitions and we all become rational atheists exactly. who are motivated by the good and who can think rationally and clearly. It's like, no, the religious instinct just drops into the political and then all hell breaks loose. Yes. So, it, it's an anti-scientific an anti uh, observation. Uh, in, in the least, at the least, you know, humans have the tendency to believe. It, it's yes, well, this, is an, this is an important problem. Like we have, you you can it's make a, a strong case that we have a religious instinct, and then the question is, well, what is that? How did it emerge? What does it signify? And what do we do about it? And those are, I think, sophisticated scientific questions. Yes, it's perhaps that the yes, you know, per, perhaps it's the recognition that we are just very small in this world and being part of something bigger than us and belonging to that part that is bigger than us reflects at some point what you were saying the, you know god can express himself or herself or whatever how people can want to put it that god is expressed there uh, uh, showing us that we are just a small part in the in this universe i think it's a it's a recognition of our limitations it's a recognition of our faults of our vices it's also a, a celebration, perhaps, of our virtues, you know. But uh, I think it's uh, my question is uh, my point is that I had um, last week I talked to um, John Lennox. I don't know if you have heard about him. The North no, Northern, no. he's a Northern Irish uh, professor of mathematics at Oxford. He has uh, had very very important debates with the new atheists, with all of them, with uh, Christopher Hitchens, with uh, Peter Atkins, and Richard Dawkins. And he's a, and when you see his debates, uh, you can see a very kind and composed and very secure man, who who raises exactly one 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 point that you have you have raised, which is. You know, these people just are anti-scientific in their in their observations. They are just denying an empirical reality, which is that we well, tend to you know it's it's possible too though that the science has actually progressed beyond that, that initial new atheist claim because things have got more complicated. So I mean it's become obvious, let's say in the last 30 years, that our moral instincts are much deeper than we thought. They're much more based in emotion and motivation. They have a they have a biological foundation. Mm -hmm. That part of the religious instinct is the is the desire to mimic, to mimic, to imitate, to become yes, imitate yes. the ideal, to feel awe. It's partly associated with our 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 conception of dominance within human beings or or authority, mm -hmm. and except it's abstracted upward. And then there's a lot of research that's been going on too in in the in the community of of psychologists who've been dealing with psychedelics, and and have demonstrated very clearly, as as far as I'm concerned, that. You know, the possibility of mystical experience is there so in in such a demark in in such a demonstrable reality that you can induce it with material means. And and all these things have to be taken seriously. And I don't I don't think they have been. They're they're generally by the enlightenment types that pursue the new atheist doctrine, they're brushed to the side as epiphenomenal. And it's not obvious at all that they're epiphenomenal. I think they're central. Mm -hmm. I read a book recently called The Immortality Key, which was quite interesting. And he, the author, who's very smart, and he um, he made the case that Greek rationalism was nested inside the Eleusinian experience, and and he believes that was a psychedelic experience, by the way. But that the, so the Greek rationality itself, out of which our rationality emerged, was embedded within a, a, a tradition that extended from the shaman the shamanic tradition upward, and and that and that. That was the lifeblood of Greek civilization. And I think that's very plausible to, to me. It's very likely. So there is a serious question here that that we all need to address. And 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 that is this this issue of 
well of religious belief and what it signifies. Well, yes. Um, if if I mean taking into consideration what 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 our discussion has how 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 our discussion has gone through, uh, and going back to the youth, and when you see why God is fading away in in this at this at at least in this current uh, moment in in time. Um, you put it in, in front of the youth, let's say the young people, you put them, you have two offers for them. For one side, you have the technological offer, the er earthly technological offer. You can become Tony Stark. You can have all the women of the world. You will, uh, this utilitarian hedonistic culture, you know, where you will have pleasure and you will be gratified and everything will work in your favor because you are again, a subject of, of endless, of endless uh, rights. And on the other hand, you have the Christian doctrine which tells you, you know, you have to sacrifice yourself. You have to give all your time to others. You have to respect women and, you know, be go virgin to, to marriage. And perhaps if you work really hard in this world of sacrifice, maybe your, your price will be that you will meet God in the other world. Now, these are very, these are two competitive views. One must be, if I were a 15, 16 year old kid, I know for sure which one I would take. I think one of the limitations right now that or one of the problems with Christianity is that how it is being not sold, but I think it is very difficult to to sell these uh, the the goods of Christianity in a current well, moment. Part of it, I've talked to Bishop Barron, for example, about this, and some other many other Christians about this. Uh, um, and part of it is, I think that they're not asking enough. That's it's not that it's too much. It's too little. It's like because young people do actually want they want that sacrifice. They want to know that they can do something important and they understand that that means making sacrifices to the degree that they're mature. But it's not that easy to articulate these things. And then on the religious front, on the Christian front, you run into the well, a couple of things have happened is people are less inclined to identify with the traditional religion. But there's no evidence that their affiliation with spirituality has declined. In fact, as the dogmatic traditions have declined, the proportion of people who describe themselves as spiritual has increased. Now, that's and you see that even reflected in people like Sam Harris, who is mm -hmm. completely anti-dogmatic, but pursues meditation and all of these other things. So he won't crystallize his spirituality into a set of doctrines. And the reason for that is because his rational questing mind would undermine the doctrines. Mm -hmm. Now, but that's not mm -hmm. sufficient for people who are, who don't believe that the dogmatic formulations of the human race are without worth. I mean, look, when we talk, we accept dogmas all the time. We accept some things as true so that we can discuss other things and let them open up. Thought itself is the interaction between dogma and, 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 and innovation. And you can't just abandon the dogma. Now, the problem is, is the dogma is very difficult. It's very difficult to account for. You know, so with Christianity, you have the problem of, well, the resurrection. That's the fundamental rational problem, isn't it? And so, mm -hmm. so there's stumbling points there. And, but, but I think that there's much of the Judeo-Christian tradition that's highly saleable to young people. I mean, when I did my biblical lectures, and I did a series of biblical lectures in 2017, and the most viewed lecture I've ever done is the first lecture in that series. And and it's because I took the I took the book seriously. You know, I, I mean, when I run into something that I don't know what to do with, I just say, like, I don't know what to do with this. It, that doesn't mean it's wrong or stupid. I'm just not in a position to be able to comment on it, but much of it opens up. And the idea that the image of Christ is something like the consequence of a centuries long discussion about what constitutes the human ideal. It's like, well, what else would it, could it possibly be? You know, you could take the Freudian view and say, well, it's the projection of the father into space and so to speak. And there's something to that because it is a paternal image, although not not Christ so much specifically because he's young and mm -hmm. didn't have children. So he's not exactly a patriarchal figure, but at the very least people think, Oh yeah, well, yeah, we represented whatever Christ represents in music, in architecture, in art, in literature, the hero is echoed throughout literature. Well, there's something to that idea of the ideal, 
well, what's its ultimate significance? Well, then, you know, we run into the rocks there again, but that's okay in some sense, I think. Mm -hmm. And I've also started to understand too, you know, in, I was just looking at the story today, the story of it's Jacob who wrestles with the angel. It's a short story, but it's a very strange story. And, and then he's called Israel after that. I'm hoping I'm getting this right. My memory's got some holes in it, unfortunately, <laughs> right now. But um, it's a very strange story, right? So Jacob wrestles with an angel, and maybe the angel's God. And, and then his name changes. It's like, what the hell is he doing wrestling with an angel and or God? What is he doing wrestling with God? And then Israel, well, Israel is those who wrestle with God. And I think, well, that's a good definition of belief. And that's the one that's presented biblically. It's like, well, do you wrestle with God or not? Well, you tell me the atheists don't wrestle with God. Well, that's all they do. Well, maybe they're believers in that sense, right? Because, well, if you're the antagonist of something, you're wrestling with it. And mm -hmm. you have an ideal in your own imagination that speaks to you and calls you out on your misdeeds. Well, do you, what, do you wrestle with that? Well, I do. I'm sure you do. I've never met anyone who doesn't. I mean, we would run away screaming from someone who didn't have a conscience. And the conscience itself is such a strange phenomenon. It's like, it isn't like it tells us what we want to hear. Quite the contrary. I mean, the best definition of conscience is that which tells you what you don't want to hear. And so, well, what sort of relationship do you have with that? It's usually, I don't have to listen to you, although I know I should. <laughs> and so, I don't see how that's not fundamentally a religious relationship. And how are you going to get rid of that? You could say, well, it's a sociocultural construction that's internalized like a superego. That doesn't really help. It just mm. pushes the problem backwards. It's not an answer. Yeah. So, and I think that we can, we, can have intelli we can have rational discussions about this once we start recognizing the phenomena. Like, I didn't really get the connection between sports and religious endeavor until I learned the derivation of the word sin. And sin was derived from the Greek word hamartia, which is an archery term. It means to miss the mark. And I thought, oh, my God, that's so amazing because well, it speaks to our, to our deep biological history as hunters, for example, mm -hmm. to hit the target, right? And to, to hit the target is such a crucial thing for human beings. And then to, to have sin defined as failure to hit the target, it's like, oh, well, what target? How about the one you set for yourself? You know, in, in, in discussion with your own conscience. And when you, when you make connections like that and offer them to people, the lights go on. They think, oh, wow, there's really something to that. And, and I think we're going to move beyond the 19th century primitive materialist determinism of the new atheists. It's like, it's done. It's over. Yes. It's not sophisticated enough. Yes, that doesn't mean that, you know, every dogmatic claim about Christianity is correct. That's a whole different issue. There's great mysteries there that we don't understand. And we can participate in the game without understanding its full nature. Mm -hmm. I guess that the problem of, of the new atheists is that they try to address the question of God purely from an epistemological perspective. And that's a, that's a huge, massive mistake. Uh, because God, you can approach him fundamentally from an ontological point of view, from an ethical point of view. I mean, there are different views where you can delve into the question of God. And I think uh, the, the paradox is that they, they claim to be so open-minded, but actually they represent the most narrow-mindedness I have seen in many, many other people. And, and they are very dismissive also when they uh, try to debate with people who oppose their views. Now, the problem what I see right now in, in continuation with this is that what we are seeing is a battle right now between at least Christianity would represent absolute values or absolute principles, flags where people can you know, plant in the, in, the, in, the, in the ground to find some place within, within this universe. And, uh, right. They mark a center. Exactly. It's like the Ten Commandments. You, if from a secular perspective, it's a basic legal code. It's a basic legal code. So, don't uh, you won't desire the wife of your of your friend? Ah, that's a flag. Don't kill. That's a flag. So, but if you see these these uh, flags are 
um, from an ethical perspective, they are deontological. I mean, Christianity is fed with deontological ethics, with Aristotelian ethics, the golden mean. But then again, this world is more, more towards a consequentialist uh, view of ethics, a utilitarian view of ethics. Where do you see this clash taking us between these absolute values and in the name of, of utility, you know, even approaching relativistic points of view to justify the consequences of that of well, that utility. I, I well, I think part of the problem is that if you have a if you have a set of values, they have to be organized into a hierarchy and it has to be a uniting principle. And mm -hmm. I think that uniting principle, for all intents and purposes, is equivalent to God. And so there's no getting away from that the necessity of that relationship with the ideal. It's either there, represented, celebrated, united partially articulate, partly explicit, or it's invisible yes. and fragmented and distributed elsewhere. It's not, it's not good. And, yes, so, I, and there's a hole too in people because they're, they're looking for the ideal to, mm -hmm. to, to aspire to. And, you know, technically speaking, I suppose this is a discovery from neuroscience as well is most of the positive emotion we experience, we experience in relationship to the progress towards an ideal. And that's mm -hmm. technically Sorry, that's technically true. That's even true for animals like like rats. It's the same thing. It's the approach to something of value that provides the most positive emotion. Well, then you think, well, that implies that approach to the thing of ultimate value is the most is the most reliable source of positive emotion. Well, then what's the highest ideal? Well, that's something we have to talk about. But we certainly recognize deviation from it, even in our own behavior. Mm -hmm. So then we have mm -hmm. to have a discussion. Well, what is this ideal? And we're having that to some degree by proxy because those who are cynical, frustrated, disappointed by our culture, let's say, they accuse. They say the central animating tendency is the arbitrary expression of power. Okay, well, what's our rejoinder to that? Well, we're taken aback. Is Really? Well, the power does play a role it's like well and certainly it plays a role in corruption and what do we make of this claim and well that that requires some thoughts like well if that's not the central animating principle what is and we're not very good at formulating that but it's certainly not the arbitrary expression of power that's i don't think there's any evidence for that at all except mm -hmm. as an aberration partly because you know the game theorists and 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 biologists concerned with the evolution of morality like franz de waal and even animal researchers, for that matter, have demonstrated quite clearly that the arbitrary expression of power doesn't even structure animal hierarchies very mm -hmm. reliably, much less ours. It's it's just not true. It exactly. doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what works? Well, that's up to the defenders of civilization, let's say, to make the case for. And I think it's much it's something much more like benevolent fatherhood. Mm -hmm. That's the proper central animating tendency. And of course, that's subject to corruption in every possible way. But that mm -hmm. I don't care that that's not that's not the issue. The corruption is terrible. Obviously, we work to prevent that in every possible way to the degree that we're capable. But mm -hmm. it's so cynical, that viewpoint. It's so corrosive, too, because it also tells especially young men it says you're ambitious. OK, well. That ambition could be, I want personal power, or I want to strive towards the ideal, right? It, it could be either of those, or an intermingling of both. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter, because the central animating tendency is the arbitrary expression of power, and therefore your ambition is nothing but your desire to take pl your place as an oppressor amongst the oppressors. Well, you couldn't possibly conceptualize anything more demoralizing to a young man who is trying to take his place in the world. And it's going to extend to women because to the degree that they're adopting male roles, so to yes. speak, then mm -hmm. they're, are, what is it, merely because of the benefit of their femininity that they're not subject to the same corrosive corruption yes. that constitutes it's, power? It's not, only, it's not only the annihilation of identity, but it's also the annihilation of pride, of, of, uh, of this instinct that we have to compete also and also to cooperate because it's part of our of our human nature you know, of, of our biological anatomical physiological constitution and that and how that human nature projects itself into the human experience of who we are 
as as human beings or, or the way we think we interpret art literature music our history but then again come those come those differences that you're mentioning which are factual truths factual self-evident observable truths that there are differences, for example, between males and females, that there are differences between uh, different species. And be within human uh, human beings, there are also several kinds of, 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 of differences. But then again, in, an, in the name of diversity, we come towards this uh, standardization of, of, of humanity and uh, the standardization. We're looking for diversity in the wrong places, right? And that's part exactly. of the corruption of our, of our philosophy of identity. Because and and it's partly our failure to articulate what identity is in a manner that's presents a compelling alternative. You know what the advantage to the to the roughly radical left, influenced by the doctrine of class struggle, transformed into mm -hmm. the doctrine of, of of identity struggle. The advantage to that is that it, it does provide a moral universe, right? You, mm -hmm. you, you, you localize malevolence in, in the tyrannical element of the social hierarchy. Yes. And that fulfills a religious function, the localization of malevolence. And it's also partly true because every culture is partly tyrannical and corrupt. And so at least it's a partial truth, a partial moral formulation. Well, what's the alternative? a dead materialist universe. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not going to cut it. And that's so true. but so you look at you know a religious perspective, let's say, well, what's the Christian take on that? Just for example, the Jewish take for that matter. Well, malevolence is to be sought for within and conquered within. It's too dangerous a proposition to be dealt with at any level other than the individual. So you're responsible for the journey of your soul and the adversaries to be sought within. It's unbelievably sophisticated. It took humanity thousands of years to come up with that conception, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years to localize malevolence within. And it, it's a much more compelling idea. And we know this. Look, if you're a literary critic and you're not postmodern, and so you have some respect for the literary tradition, you know full well that cheap literature has good people and evil people. And sophisticated literature localizes good and evil within the soul of every character. And so that's a hallmark of the religious inspiration of high quality literature. And so literature is a dare, I mean, the Bible is a work of literature, among mm -hmm. many other things, and literature is a derivative of that in some sense. And high quality literature approaches the biblical. You can see that very clearly in Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and, and um. Well, in any in any great author, because they 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 their words speak of a depth that's religious, and part of that is the battle between good and evil in the souls of the characters, and, yes. and people can be taught this, and then you think, well, it's true for you, and so look at your own evil. That's that mm -hmm. will believe me. That will keep you occupied, and so one of the things I've also been suggesting to people is that whenever one anyone says they. And it's not like I'm not guilty of this as well. You know, you might ask why are, they aren't saying we or us, you know, because if the bad guy is someone else, well, there's true danger there. And, and I think that that is one of the hard learned explicit lessons of Christianity or of humanity that we, we managed to formulate that. I, I think one of the advantages of Christianity is an incredibly articulated philosophy of good and evil. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that that's something that cannot be casually dispensed with and it has passed the test of time also which i think it's it's a very important element you know it has been time tested and it yes, remains well, you only believe that though if you don't think that our entire patriarchal history is a consequence <laughs> of the arbitrary expression of power because you don't have any respect for it then yeah right? you just say mm -hmm. well that just makes the tyranny deeper and older and we need to we need to brush all that away and start again Yes. Yeah. Well, fair enough. But who's going to need that? Precision has never been a forte of 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 the Christ, critics of of Christianity. They like to, you know, they like to navigate in very wide, diffuse uh, concepts and ideas. Because as as soon as as you demand precision from them, they just crumble apart. They fall well, apart. They they all tend to swallow what I would say is a rather narrow Enlightenment doctrine. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm an admirer of the Enlightenment in many ways. I think that our pursuit of material redemption, I think you, you have to be a fool not to see that that's been useful. 
vaccines and so forth and, and antibiotics. And while the fact that, you know, 95, 98% of our children live to five years old instead of 50%, mm -hmm. all of those things. But there's this idea that science emerged in opposition to religion. And I think that's not, that's not really, that's not a very deep idea. And, yes. and it, I, I think it's, I think it's a shallow, very shallow view of history. There's another mm -hmm. reason I was attracted to Jung, Carl Jung, mm -hmm. because he actually assessed the emergence of, of the scientific doctrine, chasing it back into alchemical fantasy, which mm -hmm. extended over thousands of years before the, before the empirical doctrine arose and associating it with both religious ideation and a discussion with Christianity. And so he chases back the development of science several thousand years, as opposed to a typical enlightenment thinker who thinks that, you know, we were superstitious idiots until 1490. And then all of a sudden some people woke up in North Italy and, and it spread from there. Now there's some truth in that, right? Cause the technological yes. explosion emerged from that, but, but you know, that the religious, supporters would say, well, you know, well, the Judeo-Christian ethic laid the ground for the presumption that the universe was understandable and that, that you could pursue your relationship with reality through the pursuit of truth. And, you know, even Nietzsche said that Christianity died at its own hand, right? Mm -hmm. By emphasizing truth at yes. so intensely and developing the capacity to pursue truth, we started to understand well, that we didn't understand our own doctrines and then demolish them with that with that truth you know mm -hmm. so and it's also not true because for example within the within the christian school of thought to put it somewhere the the, philo the philosophers saint thomas aquinas i mean where where he's actually advocating for the emancipation of of, of reason you know and uh, to the inquire to inquire the world to to study it to make sense of it and mm -hmm. I don't know. It's it's these reductionist views that have always caricatured Christianity. Well, there's also, you know, the, the the proclivity of of the Jews who established the basis for Christianity to worship a book, to worship <laughs> thought itself, verbal thought itself. It's like, how long did we have to train before we could think like scientists? Well, that would start by being subjugated to the dictates of a book, to, mm -hmm. to the concept of a book, to the concept of articulated thought and rational discussion about what all that meant. I mean, all of yeah. that was a precursor for what became science. And so the Salamanca school, for example, the Salamanca school of, of thinkers, you know, Fray Luis de Leon, Domingo Aspilcueta, these guys who inverted, uh, they are the, they are the, the, the proponents of the free markets at the beginning, you know, in the 16th, 17th century, you were talking already at the University of Salamanca of, of economic questions, of international law. How can these people be? I mean, these are massive black swans that disprove these, that falsify all these, all these idiocy from neo atheists that I find that particularly irritating. But again, I would, I would also agree with you that uh, the Enlightenment has provided some important. Um, elements to our current life you know it, it, perhaps this idea of of inquiring of of taking reason not to the extent where i think they took it to way too much with the you know the elimination of of, of religion me no, they I, grind reason in the notre dame cathedral and that didn't work out so well exactly don't exactly. replace mother of god with rationality that's a big mistake what is happening right now i mean you are you are seeing you know it's it's a, a new a, a, a cheap and, and 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 silly version of of that enlightenment replacing religious figures by i don't know technological issues by people by idols we are this story has already happened before us and it, we know the ending it's never going to be good once you just take off god completely from from the equation things can go absolutely wrong that's my quest and well it's because something else becomes god and maybe it's joseph stalin or adolf hitler i mean <laughs> exactly. well look those are the most cardinal examples right i mean the the fact that we look i think it's, it's the idea of rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. Mm -hmm. If you don't render unto God what is God's, you render unto Caesar what is God's. And that is not good because that be, then you, that's, that's, that's the, that's the what, invitation to a totalitarian viewpoint. And 
See, the other thing too, one of the things that Christianity has been criticized for, and especially by the Marxist types, and, and you can understand the criticism is, and then this is part of the idea of the opiate of the masses is that, well, life is suffering and then your reward is in the eternal. And so, but then you think, well, that's interesting because what that does is it, it makes utopia metaphysical. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. right. Okay. So then you ask yourself, well, what happens if utopia isn't metaphysical? Well, then it becomes political. And then in the name of that utopia, any sacrifice is justifiable. Mm -hmm. And so maybe if you don't make utopia metaphysical and you bring it to earth, then you justify the sacrifice of everything in its pursuit. And you can't tell me we haven't seen that. We saw that in Stalinist yes. Russia. We saw it well, in Maoist China. We saw it in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. Because everything is permitted if you're, if you're hypothetically motivated by, by the delivery of heaven on earth. Well, what wouldn't be justified by that? Exactly. Well, that's no good because you, pre you, cre you create hell while you're pursuing heaven. Mm -hmm. And so exactly. we don't even know. Well, what's the, what's the rationale, the psychological rationale for the forestalling of the utopia to a metaphysical space? You know, you just say, well, that's superstition. It's opiate of the masses. It's the priests controlling the plebeians, you know, the peasants. Mm -hmm. Which well, is pretty cynical. And, and it's unlikely that a conspiracy, you know, extended across those many thousands of years, which isn't to say that religion hasn't been used to oppress people unfairly. Of course it has. That's not the point. And so, you know, when I did my biblical lectures, I, I approached genesis as a mystery i thought what the hell is this book why is it why do we have it it's so old where did it come from what's it trying to say i i approached it with the idea that i was stupid and i had something to learn and that's way different than approaching something assuming you already know and dismissing it hmm. and i wasn't willing to throw away that religious aspect of our tradition you know, despite wrestling with it, let's say, and despite I don't have the answers, or I have some questions and some, you know, some things I've learned. And but what's so interesting is, you know, it's so weird. I rented this theater in Toronto. I did that on my own. Well, my mm -hmm. family helped me, and it was a risk. I thought, well, I wanted to do this biblical series. Well, I'll rent a theater and see what happens. It was a completely preposterous thing to do. Like, who the hell is going to listen to? I wasn't very well known at that point. Some psychology professor is going to rent a theater and ask people to listen to like 13 hour lectures. On yeah. Television. It's like, no, that's who's going to loan money to someone like that? PlayStation well, is waiting at home. I mean, well, exactly. And what happened was, well, the place was packed and most of it was young men. Yeah. It's like, well, mm -hmm. who would have predicted that? And the answer was no one, including me. <laughs> but, but it, it, you know, it, well, you can make of that what, what, whatever you want. It's that's what happened. And, and yeah, I, my, my take would be that there is a hunger, actually. You are right when you say I, I might be a little bit harsh with the youth at some point, but you are absolutely right. There's at least a huge chunk of youngster there, of youngsters out there asking for, you know, looking for answers to their many questions, looking for meaning, looking for purpose, because in this current world, these flags have been just taken, have just been taken out. And I think one of the uh, keys of the success of your of the massive success of this book was that it gave these people flags. It gave it gave them. You know, I know you are lost. I know you are confused. Here, are, here is you know, here is my my contribution to you. Maybe this will help. And try do these things. And they were very practical, not in uh, in a super confusing intellectual way straight language to the you know to the layman who can understand it and to apply it and i think that's why and why do i say this because when you read comments that some people have dedicated to you the sense of gratitude and the depth of that gratitude is breathtaking it, it is truly touching some points where oh, people him. truly say you know dr peterson thinks to your book, I didn't commit suicide. It, it must be like really, I don't know. It would be overwhelming for me. Well, I, think. You know, I read this essay once by Carl Jung, 
called Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious. And it's, I don't know how in the world he wrote that. I don't understand how he could have known what he knew. But he was talking about religious psychosis and about the consequence of religious revelation and, and the danger of confusing yourself with the central religious message. And that's an ego inflation and, and, and there's mm -hmm. the possibility of psychosis. And I mean, I've talked to people who had a psychotic inflation as a consequence of religious revelation. And you have to separate yourself from your, your it's not, If there's anything valuable in what I wrote, it's because I was able to make the central, some of, I don't know how to say it exactly. And take your time. To give sustaining truth words is not the same as to be the source of those sustaining truths. If you're an intellectual and an articulate intellectual, then you have a facility with words. And then perhaps you can use that those words in the service of the truth if you're careful. But the source of the revelation is this eternal spirit that we discussed. Mm -hmm. And so watching the effect of that on people is very overwhelming. And it, it's been very hard on me. And weirdly, mm -hmm. because it's been so positive, but it's also been very overwhelming. Um, but it's very heartening, I suppose, as well. And and but it's difficult. It's difficult to. It's. I say. I guess part of it is that this hunger that we talked about. It's so overwhelming. You know, it's it it's like in some sense all these well-fed people are starving. And then I saw that so much, and that's. It's 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 a it's a strange thing to see and and, mm -hmm. and have acted out continually. Mm -hmm. So I I guess also it must be a wonderful feeling, you know, at some point to feel that you have left a mark, that you have been positive. Because at the end of the day, that's you know you can sum up and say, well, at least I've done something good in life, uh, something that I can feel proud of. Uh, not many people can can say those things in in that scale, but I guess. Uh, and this is how I would end this uh, conversation in a very positive note is that the good thing is that there are still people asking for these kind of questions and hope is not lost in the sense that we are not just, um, you know, sinking in this materialistic, utilitarian, hedonistic world that there's people looking for searching for meaning for purpose and to become no, that's part of that religious instinct, in the simplest things to become just good people. At the end, it will be, I guess that would be it, no? Just become a good person. Be a good man. Be a good woman. Be a good yes, father. And to, say, and to say forthrightly, there is nothing better that you can do than to do that. No, nothing else you do will be better than that. None of that. No pursuit of immediate pleasure. No gratification. No narrowly selfish mode of life will satisfy you. You're not like that. And that's the other thing, because I don't, watch my audience and think you're all oppressive arbitrary power wielders in 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 their nascent form i think you're sparks of divinity you know waiting to be encouraged hmm. and i mean that and then there's something else too you see i think i understand the consequences of that not happening you know because I studied Auschwitz and I studied Stalinist Russia and Mao's China and a lot, like pain, a painful amount, until I understood it in a way I didn't want to understand, you know. I understood it as a perpetrator, not as a victim or a hero, but as a perpetrator. And that's no trivial thing. And we lose that sight of that divinity and we, we fail to encourage it. And and that's the risk, is the the risk is that people go wrong and and we end up with hell and so that's that's not what we want that's not what we need and and people understand that if if you if you speak to them about it and and you're concerned about it hmm. and you don't want that for them or for anyone else you know everyone yeah. understands that 
cynical though they may be, even prematurely cynical, you know. Would... Mm. Professor Peterson, it has been an an absolute pleasure, and uh, I would take more time, but I don't want to abuse your time. And uh, well, I hope uh, you had enjoyed your time with with us. I think uh, people in my region, you have a huge followership, a massive followership. And they were worried when you were not feeling that good. And now they are extremely joyful that you are back, you know, giving, sharing with us your, not only your knowledge, which I think everyone can show, can share knowledge, but your kindness. And, you know, I think experience, and this is a personal opinion, a personal judgment. I think experience has made you wiser and more humble. You, not that you were never humble, you were always, but I think you have truly achieved or you have truly experienced what, what real humbleness is. And that's as people strive for an entire life to achieve that. And I think at least you're in, a, in, a, in the right way on achieving that. And it's a pleasure. And I admire you and I respect you so much. And I really feel extremely blessed to have had you in my, in my program. Thank you well, so thank very you. much. Thank you very much for for the for the discussion. And I'm very happy that that we get it that I get a chance to address the people that are following you and the people in in the in 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 the in the Spanish language communities and more of thank them. Thank you, sir. Maybe when I'm on tour, I can. We would love to have you there. Thank yeah, you very very much, sir. All right. Take care. All right. Very nice. Thank you. Bye. 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 Take care.